Support for Outdoor Nevada comes from Land Rover Las Vegas and Jaguar Land Rover Reno, proud to help introduce a new generation of adventurers to the diverse experiences that our state has to offer. Information at lrlv.com or jlrreno.com. Nevada, a landscape as diverse as it is epic. Where wide open nature and wild adventure call to the curious and the brave alike. The attempt is to make the highest collegiate rocket launch in history, about 330,000 feet. A rocket is going up in the Black Rock Desert sky, and I'm here for the countdown. Best comparison, I would say, is it's, it's taking a little bit of, of scuba diving, of jet skiing, and of skydiving, and kind of combining it all into one. Jetpacks take me to new heights at the Spring Mountain Resort. Historically, this really tells a big story, doesn't it? It's a huge story. It's really the basis of where Las Vegas was born and why it was allowed to become what it has become. At the Springs Preserve, I discover a water trail to the past and a lifeline to beauty. When you're out here on the lake and there's no sound, everything tastes better outside. And on Lake Mojave, I enjoy a fine dining experience with a view. I'm John Byrne. I have a passion for the outdoors. Today we're in the Valley of Fire. And I'm on a mission to show you the one of a kind history, science, nature, and adventure you find when you step outside. This is Outdoor Nevada. One hundred miles north of Reno lies the Black Rock Desert, site of the historic Applegate Lassen Trail that was followed by fortune hunters during the California Gold Rush. Today, visitors here chase a different kind of glory. So what are we doing today? Is this a, a research experiment? Or are we recreating or what's happening? We're trying to be the first student group to launch a rocket into space. And how high is that? Uh, space is internationally defined at 328,000 feet, uh, known as the Von Karman Line. So you're going to try and make history today? Yes. Now we're not going to do it here, right? We go out that way? No, so right now we're at the entrance of the playa. We're going to head out to our launch corner. It's about eight miles east into the, uh, into the desert. Oh, this is going to be awesome. I'm following you, all right? Yeah, absolutely. Let's go. All right. Brandon Edelson and a team of students from the University of Southern California caravan to a remote section of the desert to launch their rocket. There's nervous excitement and anticipation in the air. I'll set the stage for you. We're about eight miles onto the playa. That's about halfway out here in the middle of nowhere. The attempt is to make the highest collegiate rocket launch in history, about 330,000 feet. You may be wondering, well, why bring a motorcycle? Because what goes up must come down, and they want to get it as quickly as possible. The launch site has been pre-approved by the FAA to protect commercial airspace that uses this corridor. The first time the students tried to launch this rocket, the thermal protection system failed. After re-engineering the structure, they're giving it another shot. Well, we've been here a couple of hours now. Everybody has divided into teams. You'll see them with different t-shirts on. And each team has a different station and a different responsibility. This particular one is where the rocket is being built. Let me see if I can get a word from Hey, Brandon. I know you got a lot going on. Sorry about that. No worries. Where do we stand? What's going on in here? So right now we're doing a couple things. One, we've got our avionics team over here assembling uh, our electronic systems to use um, and actually track the vehicle and get data on it while it flies. Um, here we have our recovery team assembling the parachute deployment system. Uh, we have two parachutes that allow the vehicle to come back and impact the ground safely while trying to minimize how far it can travel. So it's going so high, you need to make sure that it doesn't drift you know, 20, 30 miles and land in Reno. Ultimately, what's the big picture goal? So big picture, this, this flight is basically a proof of concept. What can a student group do on, uh, you know, at this level? What, what, is, what is accomplishable at this level? This vehicle can really do nothing but get to space. But it's a proof of technology that we've developed, and then we'll be able to use that to build a larger scale vehicle that actually insert payloads to suborbit, um, which is actually, uh, there's a market for that. So th this is also commercially viable as well. The rocket was built by the students' own hands, and they only have a short window to complete the launch. There's a lot of tension building and months of work at stake. Okay, this is a big moment because these teams have been out here since about 3, 4 in the morning. It's now 4.20 in the afternoon, and they've been tinkering and they've been testing, and we're just on the verge of finding out of whether or not this is actually going to happen today. 
So we're gonna go for launch. Avionics finalized tests, and we have nominal performance from all the units. There's an away team already in the foothills of Jordan, Jake, and Adam rising. Um, so the goal is we have a flight window till 9 p.m. Everyone's gonna come back to the launch site. We'll have cars ready and stuff, recovery teams going, and then we are going to uh, send her off. Regardless of what happens today, uh, you should all be incredibly proud of yourselves. I don't think there's any time in Rocket Lab's history we've accomplished this much in a semester, and it is just absolutely humbling to, to have you all out here. Brandon calls the FAA to confirm they're a go to launch the 155-pound rocket into space. Some 13 plus hours after arriving here, everybody is dusty, but everybody is so excited because all the testing has been done, the FAA has been called, and now the rocket is on its way to the launch pad. The sun is setting, and this is the moment of truth. The rocket is about to launch. The launch of DCX-2 Tire Biter in 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, ignition. The rocket appears to be going off course and something is not right. Suddenly, there's a plume of smoke spotted out on the playa. So clearly something did not go as planned. The rocket did not make it into outer space and they have now uh, located it in another area of the playa. It was in flames, they put it out. There's a dejected feeling going on right now. The students seem dazed as if they don't believe what's happened. A portion of the smoking rocket lies on the ground and the nose cone is missing. After nearly a year of work, this is all that's left. Well, as you can see, base camp is almost completely empty. Brandon and his team are out at the far end of the playa and they are scouring the whole thing for the nose cone, for the avionics, and for answers of what went wrong today. It's a good reminder at the end of a long day that science is imperfect. It's trial and error. Just have to load it up and do it again next year. It all started with U.S. Army technology and even James Bond got a taste of it in Thunderball back in the 60s. Fast forward 50 years and here I am checking out the updated version of a jetpack. Hey, Chris. Hey, John, how you doing? Nice seeing you. Very nice to see you. Welcome to Jetpack America. Oh, thanks, man. I've, I've wanted to do this ever since I was a kid. I'm so fired up about this today. Oh, I'm so fired It's gonna be a blast. Chris Wilson works as a training manager with Jetpack America. He's been riding these innovative machines for the past four years. He's my instructor today. Chris, this is obviously all super cool and everything, but how did you get interested in this and when? Well, I've really just kind of always been a water sports guy. Um, I was very fortunate growing up. My parents just really threw me into water sports. So my dad actually got me water skiing at two years old. He'd really just pick me up, get up, and then drop me in front of his skis so I could kind of experience it. And it led to this. It led right to this. Is this the one I'm using today? or what This is, is going to be the one you're going to be flying today. So how does this thing work? So it's really no new technology. It's just repurposed technology. So basically using a jet ski or some models, it's a modified jet ski unit, but still using Jet ski technology, the motor and everything, except instead of shooting the water out the back as a jet ski would for propulsion, we redirect it through a hose into the pack and it's the, the water flow that gets you flying. Incredible. Now, one of the cool things is too, is you know a lot of people are worried kind of about, oh, how much pressure is coming out of there. It really doesn't run off a high PSI or pressure per square inch. It'll only do about 68 PSI. What's really working it is just mass water flow. This thing can actually move a thousand gallons of water a minute. And how long is the hose to the jet ski? So the hose is actually 52 feet long, but that is connecting to the back of the jet ski and it runs underneath the jet ski. So you're losing nine or 10 feet of possible height out of it, but you can still get about 40 feet in the air with one of these things. The first commercially available jetpack was released in 2011. It costs nearly $100,000. Today, Everyone can enjoy the ride at places like Jetpack America and feel a little 007. What other sport would you compare this to? You know, it's a little different than anything. The, the best comparison I would say is it's, it's taking a little bit of, of scuba diving, of jet skiing, and of skydiving and kind of combining it all into one. So a little bit different, but, but kind of the similar feelings there. So are there age and weight restrictions? Who can come out here and do this? Uh, there are somewhat. So to fly like you're flying today by yourself, you do have to be at least 16 years old. However, on the other side of it, we've flown a guy at 85, a woman at 79. We've done paraplegics, amputees, so 
as long as you're within those ages, pretty much anybody can fly. Um, now, one of the beautiful things is we're about to launch our tandem pack. We're gonna have one of our instructors out there and basically strap the kid on in front of us and be able to take them for the experience as well. So that's gonna open it up to kids as young as five years old. As long as we can get you into the pack, we can get you flying. We have about a 95% success rate of actually getting first timers flying in the air, having a great time. And it's really all about fun. Let's see if we can get the rate a little higher. There today. we go, there we go. <laughs> now, tell me about the lake that we're gonna go into. How deep is it and is wind a factor? in this? Um, so this lake here at our, our newest location, it's about 12 feet deep. The calmer the water is, the better water flow you're going to get from a jet ski. So mm. if it gets really windy and it starts really white capped and that jet ski is going to be bobbing up and down, it's going to cause a little bit of cavitation, which is air coming through where the water mm. should be. And with that, you're going to kind of lose propulsion. It's going to kind of vibrate you a little bit. A hydro jet pack works above and under the water and is mainly controlled by the person wearing it. It can also be operated by someone on a jet ski or from the shore. I get some good height and great views. It really feels like something out of Hollywood. So you have you have a 95% success rate. Mm -hmm. uh, I just went. Did the rate go up or down? <laughs> it went up. That was awesome, man. Awesome. You did great. <laughs> you're thinking about doing something different? I highly recommend it. Chris, you're awesome, man. Thanks right. a lot. Thanks for coming out. We appreciate it. I'm going to go get dry here. Take this All right. <laughs> Riding a jetpack is one of the wildest experiences I've ever had. Now, I want to see what Chris can do. Where in Las Vegas can you find gardens, wildlife habitats, trails, and evidence of an ancient oasis all in one place? You know, it's interesting. The words Las Vegas have a Spanish translation, which means the meadows, which means a long time ago, there was a lot of water around here. But you wouldn't know it now, of course, unless you came here to the Springs Preserve, just minutes away from the famous Las Vegas Strip. The Springs Preserve spreads over 180 acres of land in the heart of downtown Vegas. This is Brandy Ides, and she is the botanical supervisor here at the preserve. Nice to see you, Brandy. How's things? I know you're busy, so thanks for taking the time. No problem. Brandy grew up learning botany in Washington State. She then moved to Arizona, where she fell in love with desert plants, a passion that she continues to nurture here in Nevada. So tell me a little bit about this area, because when I think of Las Vegas and the area around it, I don't think of the meadows. Right, very few people think about water, and so our history is really long and diverse here, and the history on our property goes back at least 9,000 years, and we have excavated ruins of pit houses, people have been living here on the site for many, many thousands of years, and it's been described as a 60,000 acre oasis. And so just imagine this area covered with lush vegetation, which it once was, but with um, settlers coming, um, the cattle grazing and the railroads taking land ownership here and the development of Las Vegas proper as we know it, it really quickly started to deplete some of the water levels and the springs actually started to dry up in the 1960s. So this is really an important area in Las Vegas. I mean, historically, this really tells a big story, doesn't it? It's a huge story. It's really the basis of where Las Vegas was born and why it was allowed to become what it has become. And so we have a very diverse history, a lot of archeological artifacts on site that we have recorded and uh, just really a lot of the history of the Vegas area. Known as the birthplace of Las Vegas, the preserve has been listed on the National Register of Historic Places since 1978. So we're in our botanical garden, and this is our cactus alley, and it features cactus and succulent collections from the Americas. Beautiful. And what do people learn when they come here and they see this, this sort of display? Our goal for this garden really is to showcase different ways that you can practice water conservation through water efficient plantings. And so looking at the op options that you have for different plant selections and placement, it's really a way to see a beautiful area, see a beautiful landscape, and learn a lot that you could apply in your own home. 
The botanical gardens have more than 1,200 species of native and desert adapted plants. Nearly all of the native cactus species were salvaged from land being developed for commercial or residential use. As we walk through, occasionally I'll look out and I'll see what looks like some sort of water pumping station, or what are those things out there? Well, those are indicative of our history as the source of water for the Las Vegas area. They're old derricks, and they're still intact, and they're able to be seen throughout the property. In the 1900s, early settlers started to draw water in private wells, depleting the resources of the valley. By 1923, the Las Vegas Land and Water Company drilled well number one to supply the city's growing water demand. The company also started to focus on conservation. This is our garden wetlands, and it's a biofiltration wetland where we have layers of sediment and all native to Clark County riparian plants. So together, those actually scrub our wastewater and treat it for reuse on site. And the, that water is reused in some of our irrigation settings and also for uh, some of our restrooms. The garden also serves as a hub for 149 bird species, as well as reptiles, amphibians, fish, and small mammals. I would imagine the personality of the preserve changes a lot throughout the year. It definitely does. Seasonally, this place is an entirely different garden, and so it's really fun to see each week there's a lot of changes. Things are blooming, things are going dormant, things are making seed pods, there's different animal activity, so it's really just a diverse and active garden to visit throughout the year. It is so beautiful, but it's peaceful at the same time. It's very peaceful. It's a great place to just come and have a walk, sit and read a book, to bring friends and family, to come alone and meditate. Very nice. About 270,000 people visit the Springs Preserve throughout the year. It's always a different experience depending on the season. These are not cacti, that much I know. What is this area here? Uh, we're now in the Lynn Mills Vegetable Garden, and so this is a great place to see vegetables you can grow throughout the different seasons. So they're all brassicas that, are, that we're looking at around us, which would be kale, collard, cabbage, Brussels sprouts, things like that that perform really well in the winter. This garden is named after renowned and beloved horticulturist, Lynn Mills. Uh, this is our butterfly habitat, and it features seasonal butterfly displays here in spring and fall. And uh, this is a beautiful example of how to attract pollinators to your home. Watch them in a habitat feeding, and just a very calm and peaceful environment to enjoy. There's really nothing else like this around here, is there? There really isn't. This is one of the only places um, in the Southwest that you can see butterflies like this. We do have some native species that we bring into this, but many of them are tropical and not from here. And because it's an open enclosure, that's why it's a seasonal exhibit. Uh, but yeah, it's very unique and a uh, really good opportunity to see these butterflies. So much going on here. I think you're only closed two days out of the year. What are the, some of the other things that people can see when they come here besides the botanical gardens? Well, in addition to the botanic garden, we have hundreds of acres of trails, about three plus acres of hiking and biking trails that you can visit. We have gallery exhibits, art, arts and crafts, a lot of children's activities. We have animal exhibits. You have so much going on here. I know you're so busy. I can't thank you enough for taking the time to show me around. I really appreciate it. Oh, you're it. welcome. Thanks for coming out, John. Appreciate it. The Springs Preserve is the perfect spot for anyone who's interested in Las Vegas' past, present, and future. Everyone knows that Nevada is full of surprises, and the Springs Preserve is one of the hidden gems. Nestled just a few minutes away from the Las Vegas Strip, it is an oasis of beauty, learning, and fun. Next time you have a little time on your hands, come on out, see how much fun you can have. This is my kind of landscape right here. You've got the desert, but you're on a lake. I just, this is my favorite place to be right here. And this is Lake Mojave. And this is my good buddy, Rod. Rod, nice to see you. How's everything going? How you doing, John? You having as much fun as I am? Awesome. Rod Taylor with Forever Resorts gives me a ride to my final destination today, a houseboat cookout. Now tell me about Lake Mojave. Tell me about how deep it is, how big it is, where to come from. Lake Mojave is actually a lake formed on the Colorado River between Hoover Dam and Davis Dam. It's 63 miles long and there's 250 miles of shoreline. And what's unique about this lake is that it's actually mostly full year round because it's a pass through lake so it doesn't actually see the drawdowns that other lakes see. And it's, you know, 80 to 100 foot deep in the deepest parts, you know, not, it's not real deep. Might be a little deeper at the other end by the dam but it's, it's a relatively shallow lake. Just by being on the water, I've already worked up an appetite. Shortly, 
I see the houseboat anchored in a perfect quiet corner. So this is, you're filling out the whole idea here. Someone can rent this, they can come here yeah. and have a great meal. This is a great idea. What are you thinking about tonight? That's right. I'm thinking about lobster tonight. Me too. Uh, <laughs> that's good. Uh, we're going to grill the lobster um, and we're going to make a little potato salad. Uh, I call it a torchon. It's a little roulade. Um, and then we're going to grill some peaches also. Oh man, let's do it. Originally from New York, Mark Purdy is the executive chef at the Alize on top of the Palms Casino. Mark has over 30 years of experience. So what have you put together so far? What have you got going uh, on here? So I prepared some stuff. Uh, these are potatoes, uh -huh. uh, onions and celery. I'm just going to make a potato salad. And um, then I'll show you we're going to make it fancy. Okay. Uh, but it's, <laughs> it starts out pretty humble. You realize for me, this is very fancy already. We're not even halfway done. This is a, a mustard, but I've already added garlic and shallots okay. and pureed it. Um, I, I'm one of the guys, I don't really like uh, mayonnaise in the potato salad. Me I kind of like, yeah. So this is just mustard, which has a ton of flavor. Already has the vinegar in it, right? I added some lavender um, and then just uh, um, celery and onions, just standard, standard, and a little salt and pepper. You like this area, don't you? I, I mean, you, you recreate here personally. I do. One of the reasons that I like Vegas as much as I do is um, its proximity to so much outdoor activity. I love the water, and obviously we're in the desert. This is all we got. <laughs> this is all we got. But it, I mean, look, it's, it's beautiful. Chef Mark is taking this experience to a whole new level. It's fine dining at its best, and with a view. Okay, so uh, we made our potato salad. I'm wow, gonna... look at that. You just yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> look at that. Yeah. He's so easy going. He's like, yeah, you know, it's really not that complicated. <laughs> you should see me try and do this. <laughs> Looks like we have a side dish. Now, on to the main plate of the night, lobster. So these lobsters, uh, main lobsters, I, I poach them quickly. Uh, if you buy these in the supermarket, you can buy them live or you can buy them fresh. So I've already cooked this one. I'm gonna do the first one, I'll show you that. You can cut the second one. The we reason I, I keep them whole so we, we can put it on the grill flat and it's still in its shell, it's very flavorful. This one's for you. All right. Oh. Okay, so right in here. All right. Okay, so we're straight. gonna pierce the shell and then straight down, watch your hands. So all right. There you go. Oh, you went all the way through? Yep. All right. Make sure we got them. And then okay. we'll do the same thing here. Or well, you just go the other direction yep. from the same spot. Right. All right. And there what what size lobsters are these? Uh, these are pound and a half. Pound and a half. Yep. Okay. I like them because they're they're personal personal lobsters, one per person. Oh, okay. I didn't know what that. I thought you knew them. <laughs> I'm <laughs> starting to wonder. <laughs> okay, so these are all set to go. Um, one of the things I prepared in the restaurant. This is a it's an extra virgin olive oil. It also has lemon oil. There's rosemary, garlic, and shallot. Just a little extra seasoning. Okay. I brought a few other things that we're gonna grill. I have some corn and some asparagus. So we got the lobster ready to go. I'm just gonna get this asparagus ready to go also. Uh, it's just uh, peeled. I'm just gonna dress it with some olive oil, salt, pepper, just make ready for the grill. And then uh, for the corn, we're gonna wrap them in foil uh, so they don't burn on the grill, but they'll still cook. Chef Mark's little tricks here and there make cooking on a boat smooth as butter. Before we uh, put the peaches on the grill, I dusted it with a little bit of sugar. The reason why, not only for the sweetness, but it's going to caramelize on the grill too. Look really nice. Is that um, this regular granulated sugar? This is actually powdered sugar. Powdered sugar? Powdered sugar. Okay. Yeah. We'll save the peaches for dessert, and for now, we focus on the lobster. You can see the, uh, the lobster seeds just simmering in the shell there. Uh -huh. It's getting all that natural flavor. Uh, we don't want to overcook it, and because it's in its shell, it's going to continue to cook when we pull it off. The lobster simmers on the grill. Its shell serves as a pan, conserving all the juices and flavors. Let's go back upstairs and finish up. Let's finish it up. So we got our fresh herbs, corn, uh, grilled asparagus. Also, I cheated. I, I brought this with me. This is a truffle and yuzu dressing. So black truffles. I made an aioli. It's kind of like a mayonnaise. Okay. And there's yuzu juice in there, which is an Asian citrus fruit. I guarantee you, not only does it look delicious, but it also tastes amazing. There is something about eating fine dining in a crowded, loud restaurant, which has its place. But when you're out here on the lake and there's no sound, Everything tastes better outside. Oh my gosh. Everything <laughs> tastes better outside. No kidding. Okay, what are you doing? Uh, 
We uh, remember we were downstairs. We grilled those peaches. Mm -hmm. uh, so, in the bowl, I'm putting some raspberry uh, syrup that goes perfect with our uh, grilled peaches, like a melba peach melba. So we'll put a little vanilla ice cream in there. This is a cherry on top kind of experience, or in this case, a sprinkle of cobbler. All right, so let's uh, let's give this dessert let, a try. What do you let's say? see how we did. The next time you're exploring the great outdoors in Nevada, make sure you try something you've never tried before. But when you do, take a big bite.